Hello, I'm Mary Lambert. It was an extraordinary experience to direct Pet Cemetery, and now it's my privilege to tell you about it. It's been a few years, uh, it's been quite a few years actually, since we, uh, since we filmed Pet Cemetery. Uh, but it's such a timeless story that I think it holds up really well. It's a, it's a classic of sorts, a horror classic. In fact, I think it probably had its very earliest roots in an in a old ghost story that uh, we used to tell. Uh, we used to tell when I was a child called The Monkey's Paw. Uh, it's, it, that ends when the um, the old woman brings her dead son back to life with her second wish, and he's so horribly maimed that she uses her third wish to to put him back uh, to death, to to send him back to where he came from. The success of the movie owes itself to uh, the master who wrote it, of course, Stephen King. Stephen King is kind of a master of the keenly observed experience. If you if you like his work, if you read his work, like this, Biffer Biffer, hell of a sniffer. Until he died, he made us richer. Now I don't know if he made that up or not, but I bet he read it. I bet he read it somewhere and just remembered it. I bet he saw it, um, or he saw something like it, and he and he made it better. And then he remembered that little tiny detail to put right here in the title sequence, because uh, it it was on the page. This whole title sequence was right on the page. In addition to the keenly observed details uh, in Pet Cemetery, uh, it's also one of my favorite Stephen King books uh, because I think it's one of his most successful forays into the interior life uh, of, a, of a character. what distinguishes King's work for me is his ability to show us the uh, interior life, the V interior of, uh, of a character. And, and I think it's my affinity for his work, and I think it's something that I do or, or try to do in most of my films. There's a recurring theme of seeing the world through a character's point of view, trying to understand how they feel and what they see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always saw Pet Cemetery as as a classic, as a sort of an iconic uh, story, and um, I tried very hard to keep the archetypal quality of Stephen's story uh, visually. Like here, we have the opening of the movie. And it's the family. It's the mother and the father, and the little girl and the little boy, and the house, and the tree, and the road, and the truck. Um, and, and across the street, there's the old man. But each one of these things is a character, including the truck, including the house, um, and of course, including the cat, which is coming up. Ellie, be careful! Ellie! Listen to your mom. Stephen makes everything into a character. That tree was such a strong character to me in the story that we actually had that tree dug up from miles away and uh, carried down the country roads of Maine and planted. It was the only thing that was wrong with the house. We searched for that house 
for an entire summer. There he is. There's the cat. Um, and, and, and this house was the closest thing that, that I could find a perfect, except it didn't have the tree. So we moved the tree. Now here comes another character, the truck. Where's Gage? I worked very hard to make the truck's characters in the movies. They're always there. They're always going down that road. The, the, in the book, and hopefully in the movie, one of the singular annoyances to Lewis Creed, he's moved to the country for the, for the peace and the quiet and, and to get away from the stresses of uh, life in the city and the fears that his wife and his family have in the city. But he can't get away from them. Who might you be a little mess? I'm Alan Creed. And your dad's going to be the new doctor up the college, I hear. And I think you're going to be just as happy as a clam here, Alan Creed. Our clam's really happy. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Crandall, yeah. there's a path over there. Do you know where it goes? Oh. Uh, yeah, that's a good story. A good walk. I'll take you up there sometime. Tell you the story, too. After you get settled in. Isn't Fred Gwynn great? He was my very first choice to play Judd Crandall, and I don't think I've ever been that lucky since or before to have the very first person that I saw in the part say yes. I went to Montana to meet with Fred, and uh, we just fell in love. He, he told me that he put uh, that character on like a pair of overalls. He, he really did, too. Uh, he became Judd Crandall. We had to dye his hair white because um, he's really a relatively young man in, in this movie, and, and his hair was black, and we had to dye it. And, of course, it grew really fast, too, so about every couple of weeks he would have to come into work early and um, go to the makeup trailer. He'd be in there chain-smoking and having his hair dyed at 5 a.m. He, ooh, he didn't like that. Did that scare you? Uh, one of the things that makes a horror movie uh, live is it's the rules. And it's one of the reasons I like to, one of the many reasons actually, that I like directing horror movies is that you can make up all the rules you want. You can create a world that exists with its own set of rules. You can ignore physics. You can ignore the law of the land. Um, but the only thing you have to do is that you, you have to then adhere to those rules. And uh, Pet Cemetery does a really great job of, of setting up a universe that has, um, has different rules than our own, but the rules are unchanging. So when people start to come back from the hereafter, uh, you buy it. It's one mean road, all right. You know that path your wife commented on? That road and those Orenko trucks, the two main reasons is there. Well, where does it lead? Pet Cemetery. Huh. Pet Cemetery. There's that damn road. Uses up a lot the of The experience at the heart of Pet Cemetery oh, yeah, is, the, is one that everybody's had. Oh, and uh, I've thought a lot about why this movie's touched so many people. Um, young people as well as older people. And, and the experience I'm talking about is, is not the experience of death, but the experience of being told about death. Because when you're a baby, when you're a child, you don't, you don't know about death. And you have no way of knowing about it except through observation. M uh, most of us are lucky not to see people dying around us with, when we're, we're small children. So someone has to tell us. Um, sometimes it's a mother or a father or a friend or a teacher or, a, I, I don't know, different people. Um, but but it's, a, it's a powerful, powerful experience. I know as a parent, uh, t telling 
my child about death was was an overwhelming uh, experience because I didn't want I didn't want to tell him it was a sad horrible thing to have to tell him that that uh, that I was going to die someday and that he was going to die someday and you don't want to tell your child or I didn't most people don't and the child usually doesn't want to hear it uh, and and this is a movie about a man whose wife I mean this is the this is the, the plot here whose wife does not want to tell her children about death uh, and Judd Crandall takes him up to the pet cemetery that's misspelled just like the children would have spelled it and he tells he tells the Creed children Ellie in, in particular uh, about death and that it's not a bad thing and that the animals die and they're buried up here it's very upsetting to Rachel and she will go on as the movie progresses to forbid Lewis really to tell her children his children about the realities of death and this is going to be the this is the thing that sets the the story in in motion this sets the madness in motion because Lewis promises Ellie that nothing's going to happen to her cat and when Ellie leaves the cat in his care and the cat dies, he's driven into a situation where he feels that he'll do anything, including try to bring the cat back to life. Daddy, look, this one's a goldfishy. That's right, Ellie. They wasn't all killed by the rod. And especially the ones from back in my time as a child. They get older as you go towards the middle, harder to read. Uh, Missy Ellen. Come over here just a minute. That's where I buried my dog Spot when he died of old age in 1924. Ellie, do you know what a graveyard really is? Well, I guess not. It's a place where the dead speak. I love that line, this is a place where the dead speak. It's not a bad thing that the dead should speak. This ain't a scary place, Ellie. It's a place of rest and speaking. Can you remember that? Yes, sir. Hi, babe. Daddy, hmm. what if Church dies? What if he dies and has to go to the pet cemetery? Honey, church will be fine. Horror movies deal with the taboos that society doesn't want discussed in a polite way. Some horror movies, you know, um, I mean, it's not just not just death. Although death is the ultimate taboo, that uh, the the thing that people don't want to talk about. They don't want to think about it. Most people don't want to think about it or talk about it. So it builds up inside of them as a fear. It builds up inside of them as uh, something they can't look at. They have to shut their eyes, turn their face. Uh, but when you go to a horror movie, you know, you know you're going to have to deal with it. And it's going to come screeching out of the closet at you. It's going to come running out of the basement. It's going to come swooping down from the rafters. Um, and, the, and, and, and you're able to deal with it and you get a little thrill out of it. So it allows, it allows people, and particularly kids, I think, horror movies, allow kids to deal with, uh, with this subject uh, in a way that satisfies their curiosity but doesn't require them to commit. Uh, it, it, it allows people to, to explore their religious, their mystical feelings about the spirit world. Uh, Without, without the embarrassment of having to uh, discuss them. Missy Dandridge, she says it's an operation. Oh. Well, the road is a lot more dangerous than any operation. Church will be just the same. Well, almost the same. And we won't have to worry about him getting run over in the road by trucks. Church will be all right, honey. You promise, Daddy? Don't shilly-shally, Lewis. Give the little girl a promise. Church will be fine. I promise. Yay! Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. 
I think that's why horror movies are more popular with younger people because younger people are are more bulletproof than older people. And this is why 18-year-old boys are marched off as cannon fodder throughout the ages because they don't really think about their own mortality. Uh, and as people get older, it's staring them in the face, so they don't they don't want to think about it anymore. Go on to get his nuts cut. Yes, thank you, Missy, for introducing that colorful phrase into my daughter's vocabulary. Don't mention it. How's that bellyache of yours? No better, no worse. You know, I can take a look at that for you. It'll pass. They always do. We shot the movie in Maine. And uh, one reason is because it was a requirement that um, Stephen King made. It was part of his deal that we would shoot the movie in Maine. But it was such a good idea because it's such a beautiful state. And... Uh, it has that um, quality that I spoke of earlier. The landscape has this quality. So many American artists have painted it. Marsden Hartley and um, is one of my favorites. Uh, but the it has this iconographic quality, this archetypal uh, resonance. Okay, this is the introduction of the character that I always like to think of as the good angel, played by Brad Greenquist. Uh, Pascal is a student at the college, and on Lewis's first day, uh, he's not expecting anything. And uh, this poor boy comes in who's been horribly, fatally injured. He can't be saved. And right before he dies, he says Lewis's name and tells him something that's at the time in incomprehensible to Lewis. I, I see Pascal as the good angel in this movie, and I'll, I'll tell you why later. I told Rachel not so much as a sprain today, my friend. of a man's heart is stonier, he says to Lewis. And then he dies. We had some fantastic prosthetic makeup on the, on the set. I, I love the design for Pascal's head. Okay, here we're back to the house. The house is a character in this movie. And Lewis is about to be visited by what he thinks is a frightening ghost and an apparition. But it's really an angel who's telling him the truth. Come on, Doc. We've got places to go. Come on, Doc. Don't make me tell you twice. We had to shoot this scene twice because the first time it was felt that uh, Dale McKiff looked too sexy. He was sleeping shirtless. He did look pretty sexy. Hey, why are you here? 
I want to help you because, Louis, because you tried to help me. The production design on this movie is very, very interesting and, and very intricate. We use the yellow house um, as an exterior. And this is the, right now we're in the, the real basement of the yellow house. We use the front porch, but most of the interior of the house was built as a set um, in a big warehouse. Because the interior of those old houses um, in New England, the rooms are very small and the, the ceilings are really low. The path was one of the most difficult things to achieve. I'm not kidding. Because of the way it was described as shining, um, shining in the, in the moonlight, we experimented with so many different kinds of fog. We, we had dry ice fog. We had smoke fog. We had all kinds of fog. But none of them would, would stay put. And of course, the the cemetery was um, the pet cemetery was a set. We built that from scratch. This is the place where the dead speak. I want to wake up. I want to wake up. That's all. Don't I'll... go on, Doc. I see Pascal echoes Judd Crandall's words, but in fact, and 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 we're led to believe, as is Lewis. The Judd Crandall is the kindly old man who lives next door, who's the friend, who's, who's the helper. But in fact, Judd is really the bad oh angel. Judd is the, Judd is the one that uh, Lewis shouldn't listen to. The barrier was not meant to be crossed. It's not my fault that you died. I think this is uh, true, that, that angels come to us and spirits come to us. And, and, and it, it, sometimes they come in the form of people in our lives. And we need to, it's, it's very tricky to recognize um, who the good angel is and who the bad angel is. And this, appearances, of course, can be very deceptive. So Lewis wakes up and he just thinks he's had a bad dream. You up, Doc? He he's just yes. thinks he's had a bad dream, except, oh my goodness, his feet are really muddy. This is like one of the most commonly written things in horror movies, that the feet are muddy, that there's muddy footprints. I can't tell you how many times I've had to film muddy footprints. Thanks, Marsh. Here we are, the family again. Casting this movie was a real challenge because um, we wanted the family to be, like I said, the archetypal family, not not too pretty, but of course, but, but beautiful, but not too pretty, believable. The little boy had to be perfect. Denise Crosby plays uh, Rachel Creed. Denise has always had that sort of archetypal quality for me of just being the American woman. I guess most people think of her as her, her character on Star Trek, but she's such a classy woman. She has so much class. The same for Dale McKiff. He's just kind of like the classic young professional. Hello. Lewis, afraid you may have a spot of trouble here. Judd, what trouble? Well, there's a dead cat over here on the edge of my lawn. Oh, Jesus. I think it might be your daughter's. Okay, here's the situation I described earlier. I love this scene. 
notice Chad's wardrobe in this scene. My dear friend Marlene Stewart was the costume designer on this movie, and uh, she's responsible for touches like this. You see how he's hidden back in that hood. If you look carefully, he, he's revealed for the sort of demonic advice he's about to give Lewis. He's revealed as the bad angel, if you're paying attention to his costume anyway. Marlene is better known for some of her more glamorous work. Um, we worked together uh, with Madonna a lot. And we joked on this movie because she had to carry around a bucket of dirt for the whole movie. Because uh, almost invariably the costumes would come to the set and they just wouldn't be dirty enough. We drove trucks over the costumes. We dragged them through the dirt. I don't want to spoil her holiday and Rachel's. Maybe there's a better way. So, do we plant them on the outside of the circle, or do we start a new one? The place we're going is on the other side of that. I've loved working with Fred Gwynn. No, we can't climb over he, he, he was such an amazing actor. He could do a take as many times as you wanted him to, and it would always be fresh. And, and he would always be right where he was supposed to be, in the light, on his mark. He loved working with the other actors, too. Don't look down. And don't stop. If you stop, you'll crash over, sure. Just don't stop and... Of course, the, the, the dead wood that they're climbing is a huge um, uh, script point, and it's a huge thing in the book, that's this big pile of dead wood that they have to climb over to get outside of the bounds of polite civilization. Once you climb over the dead wood, you've, you've gone outside the little white picket fence. You've left the, the carefully painted uh, little yellow house and the tree with the swing and everything that's safe and, and you're, you're in the woods now. You've even gone past the place where the dead speak in, into a place where uh, you don't know what the rules are going to be. Much longer now. Maine was so great. It was just so full of uh, was so full of things that all you had to do is point your camera at, and there they were. I created this route uh, that they take to the. Um, Micmac burial ground. Of course, it's lots of different sites. I spent a long time. I dragged the crew all over Maine looking for, for these locations because I wanted the trek up there to be almost ridiculously difficult, um, supernaturally difficult. So we we went to an old quarry for this for the climbing of the rock, and then we went way up to the top of a mountain. As I said, the landscape of Maine plays a huge part in the movie. What is this, this is not place? a real burial ground. This was their burial ground. Whose burial ground? Make my Indians. I brought you here to bury Ellen's cat. Why, for God's sake? I said, why? This was designed by Michael Hannon, the production designer. It was based on... Um, Indian drawings. It was based on research in, into Native American uh, symbols. And I'm smoke. I'd help you, but you got to do it yourself. Each berries his own. It was designed to be shot from a from a height. I wanted to shoot it from high up because I wanted to feel like the spirits were looking down on the Lewis Creed as he commits this sacrilege.
There's always a lot of digging of graves in horror movies, too. Okay, here we are. We're coming back to the safety of civilization. We're coming back to the safe child's draw, little child's drawing of a house, and there's the picket fence. I love this shot. It's one of my favorite shots through the screen door. And of course, this is in the real house. Lewis? Lewis? Yeah. When you talk to him, not one word about what we've done tonight. What did we do tonight, Judd? This is Judd. And he's going to tell Lewis here that the soil of a man's heart is stonier. What we did, Lewis, was a secret thing. Women are supposed to be the ones who are good at keeping secrets. But any woman that knows that dog will tell you she's never seen into a man's heart. The soil of a man's heart, Lewis, is stonier. And Lewis is going to wonder whether he's done the right thing or not, or whether he's listened to the right person or not. The soil of a man's heart, Lewis, is stonier. He, Fred worked on that Maine accent. So now Lewis is going to call his family, who are visiting in um, Chicago with his in-laws, who he doesn't like and who don't like him. And Judd's going to go back outside with the trucks, with the evil trucks. Hi, Dory. It's, uh, Lewis. This is a very important setup for later in the movie when, when uh, Gage comes back from the dead and, and calls Lewis on the phone. I, I really wanted these two phone conversations to echo each other in a very strong way. What do you see him? Gage is just so cute when he talks to his daddy on the phone. Miko Hughes plays Gage, and he was just, I have to say, an incredibly brilliant piece of casting. There was some pressure on me to um, hire twins at the time because uh, children this young, of course, there's a lot of rules that govern how long they can work. I think it's two hours, only two hours at a time. Hey, Daddy, I love you. Hi, Daddy, I He's love so cute. you. so cute. Um, but after I met Miko, I just knew he had to play the part. He was so, he was so amazing. He, he was so willing and eager. He really wanted to be a little actor. He, uh, he was, uh, I think in the movie he's supposed to be just barely two, and in reality he was closer to three. But uh, you can see he's very verbal and... He was incredibly willing to learn to hit his mark and to wait till action. Jesus. Uh oh, Church came back from the dead. Anyway, Miko's gone on to become um, uh, a very accomplished actor. He's a, a young man now. I guess, 16 or 18. And I've seen him several times, um, actually in the last few years, because I know some of his friends. Okay, Church, one of, one of the other characters in the movie. We had, choosing the cat was a big, was a big deal. And um, I went for these, I think they're English grays. It's a special kind of cat that has really thick fur. You can see how thick it is. They're beautiful cats. Oops. We had a lot of cats. We had eight or ten cats. We might have had more. We might have had 15. tell myself that I buried him alive. I'm not a vet. It was dark. Sure it was dark. But his head swiveled on his neck like it was full of ball bearings. When you moved him, he pulled out of Frost, Lewis. Now, Judd, Judd ultimately is the one that brings Lewis to his ruin. Um, he's the one who takes Lewis up to the pet cemetery 
teaches him how to bury the cat and bring it back to life. Judd, as you're about to find out, knows that w when the creature comes back, it's not going to be the same. It was the rag man who told me about the place. He was half Micmac himself. He knew how I felt about my dog, Spot. He buried his dog, Spot, up there. That's what he's telling Lewis right now. And he knows that, that the, when the dog came back, the dog was an abomination. I think that's his own word, abomination. So we're having a flashback now of Judd's mom. I loved these flashbacks because we shot, we shot most of the flashbacks um, in, in, you know, in situ there in Maine using the, the old houses that have been there for, for hundreds of years and using the Maine light. And they were just fun. They were a fantasy for me to shoot into kind of like a dream to recreate. I really enjoyed recreating them. You saw his bones still lie. Man doesn't always know why he does things, Lewis. I think I did it because your daughter ain't ready for her favorite pet to die. Maybe with more time she'll learn what death really is, which is where the pain stops and the good memories begin. I had such a great collaboration with Stephen. I, I, I'll, I'll always treasure it. Um, Stephen King was really a dream to work with. For he, I think he knew, I mean, I'm sure he knew, because that I completely respected his, uh, his work and I loved the story and I, and I really didn't want to uh, change anything. I just wanted to bring it to life. But I think he also really respected the way that I visualize things and the way that I see things in my head. And uh, he was always open for a, uh, a suggestion on how to make something, how something could be shown, even if it required a little t a tweaking of the script. We didn't really change the script at all from what he had written except to... Uh, uh, lose things that we, di you know, didn't have time for to readjust things that to fit the locations that we found, uh, or in some cases to add a few, um, add some new scares. Oh. I think that's a really gross shot. I'm not going to say why. I think it's obvious. This was a set, this bathroom. How the, hell did you get in here? the sets were really well done. Ouch! Ouch! Stephen loves to scare people. He gets excited. Daddy, he gets excited by any idea that he thinks will make the scare deeper or more profound. Lewis is lying to the daughter right now, and he's he's mad because he his wife has forced him into this position. Ellie's a little bit psychic. She's psychic in the book. And I don't know that it comes across in the movie. It was really a hard thing to bring across. In the book, the, Lewis is irritated by his daughter. Even at times, he hates her. Hey. So here's one of our mini cats. Cats are very difficult to train. In fact, they can't really be trained. Um, but you can you can get them accustomed to doing one or two very particular things. But you've got to have a cat that's already got a is predisposed to want to do that particular thing. I'm I'm a cat person myself, and I'm very amused by I'm very amused by cats. We had a cat who was a a scratcher. We had a cat who was a hisser. We had a cat whose specialty was jumping. We had a cat. Um, who would sit still. We had a sitter. Each one of our cats had a, a particular thing it was good at, it liked to do. But even then, the cat will only really do that thing when it's hungry. So you 
bring the cats to the set uh, before you fed them. And they will do their thing that they do two or three times. Then they've had enough liver, and that's about it. Missy hangs herself because she has cancer and she's in pain. And it's very sad. I think the purpose of this scene is to s say that sometimes dead is better. And now, may the Lord bless you oh, and keep look, there's Stephen. I wanted him to be in the movie. I was just, I so wanted him to be in the movie. And so we decided on this part for him. It didn't require too much of his time, but it was a speaking role. Rachel not feeling well? Well, just a touch of the flu. She's in bed. She's been throwing up ever since Mrs. Rogers called and said Mrs. Dandridge. That's Dandridge. enough, Ellen. Poor oh, Missy. I don't know why I got to take someone like her. She'd still have a bunch of years left in front of her, and that's an old fart like There's me. also a subliminal idea going on here, which is that once Lewis uh, defies nature, defies the laws of God and nature, and buries church in the pet cemetery, and church comes back to life, that he, the, uh, he unleashes demonic forces w which start to affect everybody in a very subtle way. And poor Missy is one of the people they affect. She she's she's moved to uh, she's moved to kill herself. Scientists don't know why. What's up, sugar? Daddy, do you think Missy Dandridge went to heaven? You want to talk about it? Is Missy in heaven? Do you think? I don't know, honey. I mean, different people believe all sorts of different things. Some believe in heaven or hell. And some think we come back as little children. This is the scene where Lewis forced to discuss death with his daughter. You can see that Rachel's very upset by it. And so is Dirt. We did that effect in their eyes. We did it um, as a ca an in-camera effect. By you, you shine a you shine a light uh, from a mirror right into their eyes, and when they look right into the lens, you have to look right into the lens. Then their eyes do that naturally. We had a second unit that did a lot of the animal stuff. It's very painstaking to work with animals. I thought you might have. This is the scene where um, Rachel tells Lewis about why, finally confesses to her husband of many years, why she's so afraid of death. Uh, she tells us the story of Zelda, her sister, who had meningitis and who she was forced to care for as a young girl. My sister, Zelda. I know, she died, spinal meningitis. I wanted Zelda to be so creepy, and we, as we were casting, we were casting little girls. This is one of the little girls that we came, that was, you know, in our casting process. But we were also casting for the horribly suffering and maimed Zelda. And all the little girls that came in were, were so sweet, even the ones that were thin. We were told, to, you know, the casting. Uh, the casting directive was for a, a little girl who was very thin. And the thinner they were, the sweeter kind of and more appealing they were. So finally I had the idea to cast a little boy because uh, for a couple of reasons. First I thought that a little boy would, would be more into the idea of looking ugly and coughing and spitting up and retching and... 
Uh, and also, I just thought there would be something so off about the little boy playing a little girl that it would be scary, and, and, it, and it is. Oh my God, she's choking. Zelda's choking. And they'll come home, and they'll say, I murdered her by choking. They'll say, you hated her, Rachel, and that was true. And they'll say, you wanted her to be dead, and that was true, too. This scene scares a lot of people more than anything in the movie. I just relied on, on uh, my younger sister, who I used to torture and scare with scary stories when I was a little girl, and I just tried to think what would scare her the most. Not, not, not today. Uh, but when she was a little girl. I was crying, <laughs> but you know something, <laughs> I think maybe. Denise is very good in this scene. It's very difficult to tell a long, long story like that on camera. If you were, I salute you for it. And if I ever needed another reason not to like your mother and father, I have one now. You should have never been left alone with her, Rachel. Never. Where was the nurse? They actually went out and left an eight-year-old kid in charge of her dying sister, who was probably clinically insane by then. Where are you going? I'm going to get you a Valium. But you know I don't take... Tonight you do. Lewis is going to give her an animal tranquilizer. I'm just kidding. He's going to get her a Valium. Okay, so here is the truck driver. Um, who's going to be the unwitting death of poor Gage. And here, here's um, singing the Ramones. I, I think really, if you want to know the truth, I think this is, the, this is what sealed the deal for me with Stephen King. When I, um, because the reason I, I got the job was because I met with Stephen and with his producer, uh, Richard Rubenstein. And Stephen and I just really saw eye to eye on the on the material, and uh, Stephen liked me, and and he, uh, you know, he indicated his preference for me, and that's that's why I got hired. But I think it was because I knew the Ramones um, quite well, uh, partly because of my music video career, and partly just because they were in my circle of friends. You're flying it. It's the car. You got it. Gage is flying. This song was in the script from the very beginning. But uh, to, to me, that there needed to be that that kind of hard edge that, of this sort of urban punk mentality to has to come and, and interrupt this idyllic family scene. It was just such a perfect song. I knew the Ramones would uh, would give it to us. Again, the main landscape, isn't it just unbelievably stunning and beautiful? I mean, this field is right there next to the house, and the lake in the background. And that one moment when you turn away from your beautiful, perfect son to look back at your beautiful, perfect wife on a beautiful, perfect day, and the truck is coming down the road. Get the baby! Get the baby! Get the baby! It's so horrifying to, to a parent to even imagine this moment. I believe that one reason this story is so powerful and so powerfully told by Stephen King is that I think that it almost happened to him. He, ha he has children, and that one of his sons was running towards the road on a beautiful summer's day, and Stephen ran, and he caught the son and, and stopped him and caught him up in his arms. And, and he told me that the whole story flashed into his head at that moment, like, what would he have done if, if, his, if he had lost his son, if his son had been hit by that truck? 
What would he do? To what lengths would he go to to um, bring his son back? I want to go back to my own room. I can't sleep with Mommy. She keeps stealing the covers. Ellie, what you got there? Hmm? What you got there? Let me see. Can I see? I had done one movie previous to directing Pet Cemetery, and it was a movie called Siesta, and it was a movie about obsession, about obsessive love. It was about a woman who was so in love with this man, and, and he had rejected her in favor of his wife, and she couldn't give him up. And when she dies, she still can't. She loves him so much. She can't admit the reality that he loves somebody else, and she can't even admit the reality of, of her own death. So the, the whole movie takes place in the, in the moment that she's dying and, and uh, refusing the reality of her own death uh, because she's so obsessed by, uh, for love of this uh, man. And when I was given the script for Pet Cemetery, I thought at first, I don't know if I really want to direct a, direct a horror movie because I don't m movies that dwell on people being tortured or dwell on human suffering. But when I read the script, I realized that it was really very similar to Siesta. It was about obsession, that, that, that death d doesn't interrupt. It is about obsession that, that goes beyond the bounds of death. It's, it's a love story between the father and the son, and he, he refused. He loves his son so much that he, that he, he, can't, he can't give him over to death. You killer of This little moment, that was a very important moment to me, that little moment where Lewis sees his tiny hand, um, in the horror of the moment when the, this brawl starts at the funeral and the father-in-law, who he detests, knocks the coffin over and, and he sees that little hand dressed in that little funeral suit. The funeral scene was uh, much discussed as a scene that m might have too much... Uh, reality uh, for a movie like this, that maybe it was too sad and it should come out of the movie and we should get on with the scares. But I think that that's another reason this is such a powerful movie because uh, it respects the emotions of the people, of the people in the movie. It respects um, the sadness. Good night, Daddy. So Lewis has um, saved his daughter from the pain of the death of her animal, the death of her cat, but he's unable to save her the anguish of losing her little brother. He hasn't done a very good job of teaching her about death. I don't want this to sound the wrong way because I love animals and respect them, but sometimes animals help us learn about um, spirituality and death. In this case, church is, church is part of the demon force that's been unleashed, and he doesn't like Lewis. I was going to say earlier that um, none of the animals were hurt in any way in the making of this. Uh, the making of this movie it was closely supervised by the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and all the rules were followed. And the animals had it better than the people in most cases. Shorter work days. I can't say better food. We had really good caterer on the set. We had really good seafood every day from the main coast, so. John, I buried my son today. I'm very tired. 
I wonder if we can just... You're thinking thoughts. That's not thought of, Lois. I'm thinking about going to bed. I'm responsible for more pain in your heart than you should have tonight. For all I know, I may even be responsible for the death of your son. What? So here comes the bad angel. He's he says he's he's going to take responsibility. He's trying to help Lewis with what's happened. He says he's he's responsible for the death of Lewis's son. He's talking sort of broadly about this demonic force that's been unleashed when you when you tamper with the pet cemetery. Judd, Judd pretends that he's there to stop Lewis from um from taking uh, the son up there, but. And he's about to tell him another story about something that he remembers from long ago. But in a way, he's just validating it for Lewis. He's just making it into more of a possibility with this story, the story of Timmy Baderman. This was really fun. I love the character of Judd Crandall and, and how he sort of, he represents the, the memories, the, you know, the collective collective consciousness of society and all the sadness of men who've died, gone away and died in wars and plagues and earthquakes and disasters and reaching back into antiquity. Well, sometimes that is better. The person you put up there ain't the person. I loved the break. Uh, in the monotony of filming that these there's Timmy Baderman's eating a leg the sort of complete fantasy of these flashbacks because I always feel with a flashback that the director has license to um, ignore certain physical realities because memory is fickle you don't always remember everything exactly the way it happened Margie, who finally came to some of us men folks and said it had to be stopped. She knew it was an abomination. Whenever you're filming um, uh, you, uh, a film and you go to the same sets every day and it takes you a long time to, to work your way through the, through the scenes, it's always fun to just go someplace completely different for a day and shoot something completely different, have all new visual stuff. I'm very, I'm a very visual person. Looking at things makes me happy. Uh, looking at paintings makes me happy. Looking at landscapes makes me happy. Looking at people and faces and color, phenomena, all these things. I, I don't know how to explain it exactly. It just makes me happy uh, to see things. Burning this house down was amazing. I mean, we really burned an old house down to the ground here. And if you've ever been this close to a fire this big, the heat is, is terrifying. It's really, really frightening. We, we must have been 50 yards, 40 yards away from the house with the cameras. And, and the heat was so intense, it was really frightening. And it's kind of exhilarating and really beautiful to watch it burn all the way to the ground. I, that, my, my director's cut had a lot more of the burning house in it and I was persuaded that the, of the wisdom of taking it out after a few people fell asleep in that scene. the power. I may have murdered your son, Lewis. This could be the beginning of Patching things up with your folks. Rachel goes back to see her parents, which is a mistake. It's one of those decisions that you look back in retrospect and you say, I should never have left my husband alone. He needed me then. Horror movies, more than anything else, are about those decisions that you make if you, you know, if you hadn't run out of gas, if you hadn't forgotten to lock the door, if you if you had, if you'd only stayed where it was safe, if you'd only protected your son, 
If you'd only done something just a tiny bit differently, none of this bad stuff would have happened. Daddy, please come with us. I'll be there in three days. Four at the most. I please, think. Daddy, I'm scared. Everything's going to be all right, Ellie. Do you swear? Now, why is Lewis staying there? We know why he's staying there. He wants to be there alone because he's already made up his mind that he's going to bury this uh, little boy in the tainted ground. I don't think he's admitted it to himself yet. We talked about this a little bit, Dale and I. The character of Lewis Creed hasn't yet admitted to himself that he's going to do it. But but now he has. a man, a doctor, to commit an irrational act like this. What's he thinking right now? He's thinking, I'm just going to dig him up. I'm just going to dig him up and look at him. It's wrong. What happened to you is wrong. Remember, Doc, the barrier was not meant to be crossed. The ground Summer. His good angel comes one more time and tells him the barrier is not meant to be crossed. We went with crazy here. We went with a man who's it doesn't work. Completely lost his his sanity of he comes grief. back. And he's like Judd said Timmy Benjamin was. Well, I'll just put him back to sleep. And they don't have to know. Rachel and Ellie don't, don't ever have to know. We put up this wall of dead people um, at Rachel's mother's house. I think it's really creepy to be in a house with pictures of people on the wall that are most of them dead and you don't know who they are. Honey, you just had a bad dream, that's all. You know that, don't you? It wasn't. Is this Pax cow? Is he, is he like the boogeyman? So Ellie has a dream, a warning dream, that, uh, that if only she could tell her father, perhaps she could stop him from something he's about to do that's really bad. And I believe in the power of dreams, personally. I think there's information in dreams that's, that's very important that we need to listen to. And the stronger the dream is, you know, the, the more important the information is. So... A scene like this is very important to me, and it was very important to me that the, that Blaze, who's playing Ellie, uh, really convey this emotion and the distress that this dream causes her, um, and I wanted her to cry, and we talked about it for a long time to see if she could cry, and I asked her to maybe think about an experience that she'd had in her life that was very sad, that caused her to, to cry, or and that made her sad, and if she could go there, she was very young, she was like six or seven years old, she couldn't think of anything that was sad enough to make her cry. So I fell back on a trick that Denise's husband um, suggested to me, which was I offered to pay her extra if she would cry. <laughs> she did a really good job in this scene. Two outs. Okay, the picture on the wall behind Denise is one of the pictures on the wall in her parents' home. This is a tradition in American uh, painting 
uh, early American painting where they painted uh, children and they painted them like little adults. Uh, they dressed them up in these kind of bizarre outfits and painted them like little top hats and stuff and painted them as though they were adults. And it's, it results in some very, very creepy paintings. And I wanted this, this sense of, of a child being made into an unnatural being to, to be subliminally hinted at here in Rachel's childhood home. No. Well, if he drops by, I'll, I'll tell him to call you. Don't bother, Judd. I'm coming home. Rachel, no. You don't want to do that. I have to do it, Judd. Goodbye. Rachel? Rachel? It's really hard to dig a grave like that. Lewis has been at it for a while. The script was a little long. Um, it, it, it was difficult to, you know, it was difficult to cut anything out of it because everything seemed important and good. And one of the uh, one of the aspects to the film that I haven't mentioned yet is the editing. Um, I had two really great editors who work as a team, Dan Hanley and Mike Hill, and. They really did an incredible job of compressing the stuff that the, the film, which was a little over long, without losing the the moment and and the feeling that it does take a long time to dig a grave, and the moments in the landscape that were really important to me, the quiet moments. Okay. It's going to be all right. I swear it's going to be all right. Here you can see the demonic influence at work. The pictures on the wall have all been moved around. The demonic force that, that has been unleashed is, is, is awakened uh, Zelda. I love the score for Pet Cemetery. I was a huge fan of Elliot Goldenthal, and I, I just knew he was going to do something really fabulous. He called me once when he was composing the score. He was somewhere in Europe, and, and he, was, he had found this piano that he felt was just the most incredible piano he had ever heard in his life. And he said he wanted me to hear it. It was like, you know, two in the morning here when he called. And uh, he puts the telephone receiver down in the room somewhere and just starts playing the piano. And I listened for a while, but he, it went on for a long time. <laughs> Good evening again, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We've had a strong tailwind, and we expect to arrive at Boston's uh, Logan Airport almost on time. Thank God.
there were a lot of really talented people who who's worked on this movie and I think the result was was really better than anyone could have hoped for. I, I think uh, the su success of the movie uh, surprised people. It was released kind of at an unusual time um, early in the year. You know, did, did, they didn't want it to have to compete with any of the summer movies or anything. The Deadwood was a hard thing because we had to build it, and it was really hard to uh, uh, compete with nature in Maine and build something out of nature. All this stuff, all the exteriors were filmed in, in the exterior. None of it was on a set. I'm sorry. It's been very busy. I really don't have anything. What about the Aries K, the one with the scratch on its side? I do have an Aries K. Pascal, besides being the good angel, uh, he brings another element to the movie, which is a little bit of humor. Major credit card and a license. I think it's important for people to be able to laugh in a horror movie. You've got to be able to let go of the tension. This next effect that's coming up, I, I int always intended this to be scary, but at the same time, a little bit comical, ridiculous, kind of. I mean, I planted the seeds of that shot earlier when, when he comes up and we see that pile of rocks. I always intended for it to become um, Fred's face. I think um, when one has a very bad nightmare, uh, the the best way to get over it is to is to wake up and then and then relive it as vividly as you can. Tell tell it back to yourself as a story. Usually, there's some element in it that's really laughable. This is what I always told my child um, when he would have nightmares: is to, you, you, to tell it. You know, let's hear it. Say it out loud. And usually, when you say it out loud, there's something in it that's so stupid you have to laugh at it. And and then it um, it loses its power to uh, to uh, rule you. It can still frighten you, but it doesn't rule you any longer. Once you realize how funny it is. Now what? It's trying to stop you. Do you hear me? It's trying to stop you. It was raining all night when we shot this scene. It was one of the more unpleasant nights I've ever spent. Is anywhere. I'll never forget going to Ralph Singleton, who um, was my producer there in Maine. Um, and he's a wonderful producer, and his he just kind of cuts to the chase. And, and I'm like, I look at him, I'm like, Ralph, it's raining. We can't. It's cold. We can't. We can't shoot today. And he looked at me. He said, Mary. You gotta go for it, which meant I had to shoot. He was right, though. It was. It was. It didn't stop us. I've shot in the rain a lot since then, and I always remember Ralph Singleton saying that to me. Mary, you gotta go for it.
This is a little bit of an homage to the hand coming out of the ground. I think it's in the end of Carrie. That's Miko's real little hand in there. One of the big discussions in that movie, in the pre-production part of the movie, was, oh, that's, that's Bob the Lob. <laughs> this is a, this was one of our locations, Bob's Lobster House. It was also a hangout for the crew and cast and the director occasionally. So one of the, one of the big decisions uh, in pre-production was how to portray the evil Gage when he comes back from the dead. He's described in the book and in the, and in the script as quite horrific. Um, it, it, you know, a truck ran him over. He's a small child. He was run over by a truck. Um, but I felt rather strongly that it was much more terrifying to see the beautiful innocence of a small child uh, being subverted to evil. I love this scene. This is one of my favorite scenes. Because it's so scary to see his little hands, his real little perfect beautiful hands picking up that scalpel, which is of course not sharp, I promise. Um, and his real little feet and not knowing what his face looks like. One of the other um, ideas for the, the gauge, the evil gauge when he came back, was to use a um, a dwarf. But dwarfs have their own physicality and, and they don't look like children at all. Um, so I really thought that was not a very good idea. And another idea was to use a puppet. And we do use a puppet uh, occasionally. There are certain uh, scenes where we do use a puppet. But even in the scenes where we use a puppet, we also use the real actor. And the cuts back to the real boy are what keep you from feeling that you're watching a puppet. I mean, to think that a real little boy is a little two-year-old that's doing this, I think is much scarier. There was also a, a lengthy discussion about whether, when we used the little boy, if we were going to put a prosthetic on his face. But I felt that the hours that it would take to apply that, we tried it a couple of times. It was really horrible for the little boy to have to sit. It was much more horrible for him to have to sit in the makeup chair for two hours than it was to have to do anything else. This is one of the creepiest scenes in the whole movie, I think. Uh, terrifying. When the little boy attacks the incredibly large Fred Gwynn. Fred was a big man. He was well over six feet tall. I brought you something. This is a set. Don't look under the bed. For some reason, I don't know why, but this particular scene is just scares scares the poop out of people. Where did you go? It's 
So we went with just that one little scar on Gage's head instead of a big uh, prosthetic that would show that his face had been destroyed. <laughs> And here's Fred, I mean, Fred makes the scene work. And that's, of course, the real little boy um, pretending to play with Fred. And then that was a puppet right there. I did my very best to keep blood out of any scene that the little boy was actually in, that Miko was actually in, because that, that wasn't a, a good thing to for him to obsess about or to think about. And whenever he acted with Fred, like in that scene, we always made it into like a game that he was going to pretend, he was going to play, he and Fred were going to fight. Fred, he was going to pretend to bite Fred. Fred was really great with him. And it was, was so, I mean, you see, you can see in the scene how big Fred is and how tiny the little boy is, Miko. Whatever your problems are, I hope they work out. It's the end of the line for me, too. I'm not allowed any further. I'm sure things will be fine. I'm not. So the same truck that killed her son is bringing her back. <laughs> I actually did some of the laughter and demonic voice for Miko. Um, I did a lot of it as a, t a temp score when we were doing the, the temp mix, but I think some of them survived into the, into the final movie. And there was some other person in the ADR group that did some of the voices. And then later, um, Miko came back and did ADR for me. Um, and, he was, and he was a little older then. He was several months older. And that's a, that, that period of, of time for a child, uh, th their verbal skills grow so quickly. I'm telling you, Miko was amazing in this. He really, he, it wasn't just offhanded photography of a child. It, he was really acting for the camera. He understood what he was doing. These shoes were a very important wardrobe decision. I just think they're perfect. I, I don't know why I think these shoes are so perfect. And they're going to end, one of them's going to end up on the stairway. They just kind of personified Rachel for me. And uh, Marlene Stewart, the costume designer, just has a way of choosing each thing perfectly each every there's nothing that she doesn't think about it wasn't just like find a pair of black shoes it was just the the absolute right pair of low heeled shoes but not too low Zelda and Gage are kind of the same person at this point. They're the same demonic force. They're the same evil spirit. And you can see here I've dressed uh, Gage in the same outfit that's in the portrait at Rachel's mother's house. He, he is a figment of her imagination. And uh, he is a composite of, of all the things that have frightened her before. Because her son would never hurt her her real son. He's not her real son. That costume that Gage is wearing, the, the blue velvet thing, was a big source of controversy. That it wouldn't work, that it was silly. And Stephen really stood up for me on that one and said that he liked it.
gauge. More dirty footprints, did I tell you? That laugh right there, that is Nico. Gage? The reminders of his son, the happy reminders of his son. So this is um, this is the phone call that we set up earlier in the movie. His family is in Chicago, and he's here. And he's estranged himself from his family, and now he's lying to his father-in-law. Rachel's fine. Yes, she got back. No problem. Lewis knows what's happened I mean, because he 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 instigated it. He knows the boy is uh, has come back. And he knows it's going to be a problem. Ellie had a dream that her mother was dead. Er, and I can't talk to you right now. Er, and I told you I can't talk to you right now. Can you come and play with me, Daddy? He was ho he's hoping against hope that Gage would come back and he would be okay. But, I mean, how many times have you done something that you knew was not going to work and you just thought maybe it would work? It, but it doesn't work. So Lewis is, um, summons the strength from somewhere to go and undo the things that he's done. Hi, Church. Want some grub, Church? Church. One of the hardest things in the whole movie was to get this cat to eat a pork chop. Cats don't like to eat big chunks of meat like that. They like it all chopped up for them. Don't mind me. Eat it while you can. This scene is kind of violent. It feels like, you know... But, of course, we don't actually give the cat a shot. We don't actually hurt the cat. But I thought it was important to show this scene because it shows Lewis's determination to undo what he has done. And, and we know when he does this to the cat that it, it's a harbinger or a... a, a to show us, you know, what, what he knows he's going to have to do to Gage. He's going to have to put Gage down like he, he's putting an animal down. He tells the cat to play dead, to be dead. Play dead! Be dead! I really, well, I thought the scene was really important. We, we debated taking it out because n nobody really likes to watch animals be hurt. But I felt that he could say and do things in this scene that would, would take away from the emotionality of his scene with Gage, which is coming up. Um, but I still thought they needed to be said and done, and we needed to see the, the craziness, the insanity that uh, Lewis is living right now. So here you see the demonic force at work. Gage. Gage, what have you done? Rachel! 
There's the shoe. It was really important what that shoe looked like because it's the thing, it's the icon of his wife. It's the marker of humanity that sort of brings him back to, almost brings him back to reality. But at this point, uh, Lewis, Lewis is just so hopelessly confused. He's done so many things that are just the act of a, the, of an insane person that, that there's no boundaries between what is sane and what's insane. The music and the sounds really helped to build the scares and to build a sense of uh, creepiness. And music and sound work together in a horror movie. Uh, sometimes you use the absence of sound um, to accent the sound that's coming up. Lewis knows the worst now. Not quite. He knows Judd is dead, but he doesn't know where Rachel is. Here she is. He looks a little like Chucky there. That was a puppet, but this isn't a puppet. Some of it's a puppet, some of it's not a puppet. It's pretty hard to do to stage a fight between a two-year-old and a 30-year-old man, a big, handsome, strong man. How are you going to believe that the, the kid could, uh, could actually hurt him, could actually win a fight? <laughs> the editing there, I think, was really effective, and... Um, I really think the, the the use of the child and the puppet together uh, helped a lot because he was able to really manhandle the puppet. But then, then there are the scenes where you really see that it's the real, the real Gage, the real little boy. I didn't want him to be yelling at the little boy here, so that's why we we let him. He he. He yelled at the cat, but here it's the saddest thing he ever did to do what he thinks is now best for his child. I mean, this is just brilliant. Miko was just great. You feel just as sorry for him the second time too, I think, because cause he doesn't want he didn't want to be brought back from the dead. So f somehow Lewis has come to his senses now and he knows that the only way to uh, get rid of this is just to burn the house down 
think for a minute maybe he's come to his senses. And in fact, in the first version of the script, he has come to his senses, and it's, it's very, very sad. No, he's gonna, he's gonna make it worse. He's gonna bury his wife in the pet cemetery. Now there is really no rational explanation. There's no rational explanation for why he's doing it. He says to Pascal, because she just died, she just died a few minutes ago. It'll work with her. I waited too long with Gage. He's completely insane. He's, he's capable of any kind of rationalization to get what he wants. He's desperate for his, for for something to work out. A movie like this, you have to uh, you have to suspend disbelief a little bit. The original ending was more just sort of sad and quiet and, and an emotional um, uh, sort of acceptance by Lewis of, of the fact that he was crazy. But after the first uh, edit and some screenings, we decided that the movie needed a punchier ending. It needed, I won't say a funny, a, a, I won't say humor, but there is a little bit of dark humor here, I think, in the ending. Lewis is completely mad. And he's just waiting for um, Rachel to come back to him. He knows she's going to come back. He's completely convinced of that. And she does. Ruined her manicure digging out of the grave, though. Lost a shoe. This is a really important piece of work for me. I, I had a budget that was really adequate to do the things that I really wanted to do, and I had a great crew. Um, I had a great cast. Uh, and uh, looking back at it, I mean, I guess I might have done, I might do a few things differently now, but it probably wouldn't be as good. The experience of um, the collaboration with Stephen King was just an amazing the thing for me in my life because uh, we really sort of trusted each other and uh, he was just incredibly supportive of, of what I brought to the project and I just loved his story. It's a great story. And in order to have a, a good movie you've got to have a good story and it helps if it's a great story and I think just as I said before this is just such a such a classic story about something at the heart of it that that everybody that happens to everybody and and not just death that's easy all you can any horror movie can be about death but this is about finding out about death the moment where you learn about death and uh, I just think that's a it's a brilliant premise um, and it's it's brought to life with a brilliant set of characters uh, that Stephen created and what you're hearing right now if you're watching the movie is uh, I don't want to be buried in the pet cemetery that was written by my dear, dear, dear friend, Dee Dee Ramone, who, um, who died a couple of years ago. 
who I miss very much. And uh, I think it says it all. I don't want to be buried in the pet cemetery. I don't want to live this life again. It's, it's a funny song, but it's also really sad.